Hey there, and welcome back to RimWorld. My name is Pete, and today we complete episode 20 of our RimWorld adventure with the Believers of Boyo, an episode that could actually be among the last in this series, not only because of the recent announcement of the Anomaly DLC, which I have talked a bit more about in the last channel update video, link on screen and down below, but primarily also because we are rapidly getting closer to the requirements for obtaining the next piece of the Arconexus map. Somewhat in line with that, in the last episode we actually earned enough ideology development points to reform the Believers of Boyo once more, and I think we are going to do that today. In addition though, we also had Took begin an affair with Kraleth, Kevin's sister, although as you can see at the moment, him and Squeaks are still very much getting it on, so perhaps there is still something left to salvage in their marriage. We then learn that Squeaks has received another taming inspiration, just as Brandon and Took, as well as a few elephants, are heading out to salvage the remains of last episode's crashed shuttle. The raiding party here dropped a ton of pemmican, which I think will also go a long way towards feeding our guests. Yes, our royal entourage is of course still with us, although they will finally depart in just a few short days. While we wait for that to happen, our melee specialists Wyatt and Kyle go hunting. Considering the weapons and armor we have, this is not all that risky, and it has the added benefit of the animals not running away because of gunfire, so we should quickly get a hold of a few dead boars here. Just in that moment then, we also finish the research of fabrication and that means we can finally manufacture our own components, and that will obviously give us a lot more freedom to construct advanced technology. At the same time, this also marks kind of the end of the research tree, at least for this series. We have limited ourselves to industrial tech only for this one, and most of what comes next is space attack or higher. Still, as advanced as it may sound, our next research project is actually also only industrial, the gene processor. Because yes, I think today we might do our very first bit of gene modding. We'll see how far we get before the end of the episode. One more smaller project that we have planned for today is the final expansion of our hospital and workshop area. As you can see, both rooms are getting somewhat cramped and at least in the workshop we need to construct the fabrication bench too, but we do have several skilled miners in the colony so I don't think this will take us too long. In the middle of the night then, one of our prisoners attempts to escape. We already released the one in the cell to the left because they were unwaveringly loyal. This one, however, is not, so let's send in the pacifying squad. After all, this is why we gave them the bedrooms directly on the other side of the corridor. And there we go, a one collective bonk and our prisoner goes back down. It also seems like she has not taken any major injuries in the process, so our melee fighters definitely appear to know what they're doing. In the very same night then, colony leader Light loses his Eltex skull cap. Yes, it has deteriorated right from his head, so a new one might be worth putting on the list of things to buy. On the following morning then, our hospital already starts to look a little different than before. We are now moving all of the research stuff a bit further towards the back of the room, and we are also moving the drug lab back over here. I just feel like it's a better fit thematically, despite the fact that in the workshop we would get the work speed bonus from the tool cabinets. That workshop then is quickly expanded as well and we can begin smoothing everything, which I believe is actually one of the driving factors contributing to our rapidly rising colony wealth. Smoothing walls and floors is oftentimes recommended against, specifically for this reason. In our case meanwhile it does help raise that wealth value. Nonetheless, at this point we have about 40 to 50 thousand silver still left to go. After mining out the last required component we can then also begin the construction of our fabrication bench. And just like that, a steady supply of one of the most important mid to late game items in the game is secured. To celebrate, Kyle receives a work frenzy and a short while later, on the next morning, the overhaul is complete. And don't worry, we will also find a good use for all of that empty space in the lower right corner of the hospital. That however requires us to complete a few more research projects. In the meantime, good news, the Imperial Shuttle has finally arrived. After 25 days, our royal guests are about to leave us again. You can see it here, we will receive a legendary sniper rifle as well as a masterwork SMG for our efforts. And since they didn't really do a whole lot of work to begin with, we might as well send them on their way immediately. We thankfully managed to keep their mood high for all this time, and can now reap the rewards for being generous hosts. 
The weapons are then quickly hauled into the safety of our storage room, and at this point we also have to take care of one more small name change. Elephant Nartle will now be renamed to Knight Nartle. After reading through the comments on the last episode, that seemed to me like the most popular choice. Our newly acquired legendary sniper rifle then goes to none other than Maniac. As our primary hunter, he has earned it and actually also needs it. Case in point, in the evening he's out and about hunting alpaca, and of course with great success. Considering that we now have a second sniper rifle left over, we also have Nazim join him. With a double passion shooting skill of 11, he seems quite suitable for the task, despite the fact that wielding a sniper rifle is making him unhappy. But that's a problem for his old ideology, one that we will hopefully fix very shortly. In the meantime, let's focus on our own belief system and reform the believers of Boyo once more. We can now select our fourth and final meme, and there were quite a few suggestions in the comments of the last episode. For example, some of you suggested Collectivist, which I have to agree does fit quite well. However, just like with Transhumanist, I do already have some plans for it for the third chapter of our Arconexus journey. Perhaps not in the way you think, but it is enough to make me want to skip it for this one. Another suggestion then was Nature Primacy, which I have to be honest doesn't really do anything for us. It only unlocks the Plant Specialist, which we already know from our first series with the Cult of Jinx and also don't really need for only mushrooms. And we are also not going with a Darkness, as we already have all the precepts for it, so picking it would only waste a meme slot. Another suggestion then was Loyalist, but this does in fact do absolutely nothing and is also incompatible with Guilty. And so in the end I decided to go with one that we already skipped numerous times before, Proselytizer. Yes, mechanically it also doesn't do that much, but even more so than the Cult of Jinx, I believe the believers of Boyo try to make others see things their way. Hell, they even take plenty of prisoners just for the sole purpose of converting and then releasing them again, so I think this should fit nicely. Obviously, we will then also set the proselytizing precept to frequent. However, if you are now thinking that this should vastly speed up prisoner conversion, then you are mistaken. The only effect of this precept is how frequently pawns try to convert others during normal conversations. So all in all, I don't think it's going to change much, but it also doesn't need to. At least in my opinion, the believers of Boyo are fine the way they are. And at this point, there is no need to add anything entirely new. By the way, just because the timer is about to expire here, we are not going to accept the Menace Cluster quest. The threat here is just too large and I don't want to risk anything. So instead, let us finally make use of Kevin's honor points and advance him to the rank of Acolyte. As you can see, the quest also says that we don't have a throne for Kevin, but we can change that quite easily. Our Knight Brandon can temporarily give up his seat and with that we are good to go. Let's call in the Bestower and begin the ceremony. And with the entire colony of Red Chapel assembled, Kevin advances to the rank of Acolyte. Thanks to an honorable bestowing ceremony, he also earns two extra points of honor on top of it all, and that means he's now not too far off from finally becoming a knight. For the time being though, we have to select his level 2 Psycast. There are not that many great Psycasts available at this level, but we have the ability here to pick Word of Joy which I think fits extremely well with our colony's moral guide, and it also prevents us from having to spend valuable Psyfocus with Wyatt, who also has the Psycast, although it will now require Kevin to spend some time meditating each day, something he previously did not do. Coincidentally, since our guests have now left, we also have a spare bedroom, and let's give that to Kevin to satisfy his needs which now in turn also allows us to move Took out of the bedroom he shared with Squigs up until this point. I think it's better for both of them if we no longer force them to sleep together, but we will of course also not give Took an easy opportunity to simply pursue his affair with Kraylith, so in a sense I think we'll let the game figure this out for us. And with that we can now get back to Nazim and his ideology, a problem that we are now hopefully going to fix with a conversion ritual. Or at least we get close to fixing it. Unless it is a masterful ritual, it might not get all the way there. As you can see, Nazim at the moment still at 40% certainty. Let's see how much of that is left once the ritual finishes. And indeed, it is only an effective conversion ritual. Still, that means we earn a development point and should be close to finally converting Nazim for good. One more use of Kevin's convertibility and we might be done. 
One more thing that we are now officially done with is studying the major architect structure. Kevin here has put in the last few hours of research needed, and with that we are one step closer to completing this second chapter of the Arconexus journey. All we need to complete it at this point is a colony wealth of 275,000 silver, and as you can see at the moment we are close to 240, so slowly but steadily we are getting there. A brief moment later then, shortly after Took experiences a shoot frenzy, a combat supplier is passing by, although the trade we eventually agree on is underwhelming to say the least. Yes, we are only selling some drugs and survival meals. I am at the moment looking to obtain one or two more gene packs, but not the one that these guys have, and I was also briefly tempted by the recon armor here, but ultimately decided against it. And so we only earn a bit more silver that we can perhaps use in our next trade journey. In the meantime, let us increase seating capacity in our common room. With 14 colonists, 6 seats are just not quite cutting it, so let's expand here to a maximum capacity of 12. At this point, I think it is then also time to get ready for some gene modding. We will of course not be able to dive too deep into it in this series. Still, a gene assembler and a gene bank are enough to get us started. The assembler still needs to be constructed, but that should be no problem now that we can make our own components. The gene bank, meanwhile, just needs to be placed in the vicinity to be accessible. With both objects up and running, we could now theoretically recombine our first genes. Now, the way this works is actually pretty simple. From the list of gene packs that we have stored in our gene banks, we can select as many as we want to, to then assemble a unique gene pack including them all, which can then be implanted into a pawn of our choosing to give them those genes. The two major things to keep in mind about this process then are complexity and metabolic efficiency. Complexity increases the more genes we include, with rare genes, like Deathless here for example, also having a pretty high complexity rating to begin with. As a result, the complexity of the two gene packs we have chosen here already surpasses what we can currently work with, but don't worry, we will be able to fix that soon. Metabolic efficiency then is basically a rating of how good the included gene packs are, and as a result using lots of genes with positive effects increases the hunger rate of the pawn that they are installed in, while using genes with negative effects decreases that rate again. So essentially, unless you want your pawns to consume food like crazy, it is a good idea to combine positive with negative effects, and so gene packs with a few negative, but perhaps not too negative effects, that is what we are currently looking for. In the meantime, our common room overhaul progresses swiftly, and shortly before bedtime we then also finish the research of the gene processor. This is what will help us deal with those more complex genes. Now, what the gene processor does not allow us to do is to deal with archived genes, like Deathless, and as a result we will now more or less swiftly research Archogenetics 2. Despite its placement in the research tree, this is still considered an industrial technology, so for the purposes of this series it is fair game. During the night then, with Nazim out hunting, Countess Rotona gives birth once more. Before we get to naming her child though, we also have some visitors appear. But let's take things one step at a time and name another animal after a Patreon supporter. This elephant calf here will now be named Ariel. So thank you very much for your generous support and welcome to the colony. As always, let me know which royal title we should give to her, as we watch a bit more of Nazim on boar hunt, his psychopathic nature probably also lending itself well to that task. In the early morning hours then another group of visitors passes by, while we stick with Nazim and his psychopath trade for just a moment longer, giving him that sniper rifle may not have been the best choice after all, as he now digs up one of our corpses. Now obviously we could just let him do that, this sort of mental break is hardly an issue, but what's the point of having Brandon with Word of Serenity if we're not going to use it? So let's quickly calm Nazim's emotions, also known as putting him into a 6 hour coma. Took meanwhile quickly reburies the corpse even before Nazim is brought to the hospital. At this point, now that we have more components coming in, we can also quickly construct a third glucosoid pump for Vulek, which then obviously also requires us to extract some more hemogen. Luckily we have plenty of volunteers. The two groups of visitors, by the way, did not have anything useful to trade, so that's why I'm not showing you that. Instead, we are using the cover of darkness to once again hunt some more elephants. As you can see, not all that difficult with this much firepower. The following day then remains largely uneventful. Now that we have plenty of components coming in, we obviously need steel to keep that production going. So while our workshop keeps expanding, we can do some trading. And I think I have found a gene pack that I like. This one includes the raw voice and very importantly pyrophobia. 
a potentially problematic negative trait, but thus increasing metabolic efficiency, so I think we are going to purchase it. Coincidentally, this too is a gene that sanguophages also possess, which is now actually true for every single gene we have except for raw voice. So in a sense, we are essentially recreating the sanguophage through gene modding here, which does feel kind of fitting considering that we are revering those blood feeders, and well, this is the next best thing other than having them transfer their genes onto others, which as you know, they can only do once every year and a half or so. We have also just purchased a new marine helmet, which will now replace Maniac's old one, and just like that, it's night again, but our colonists are still busy. I have actually transferred a few more people to the night shift, including our hunters, who thanks to the rain outside are currently hunting boomalopes, as always with explosive results. On the next morning then we perform what I had hoped would be the final conversion attempt. As you can see though, Nazim remains steadfast at 1.7% certainty, so unless the effects of proselytizer kick in and we randomly manage to convert him during a regular conversation, we will have to go again, and that means up to three more days with his old ideology. Ideology then also a bit of a problem for one of our prisoners. With her, we had actually come very close to a successful conversion, but now she suffers a crisis of belief. And well, guess which ideology she has elected to adopt? Yes, it is Nazim's. I suppose there's nothing we can do about that but to keep going. On the bright side, just in that moment, we have a shaman merchant pass by, and it seems to be a bit of a theme today, one group of visitors does attract another, this one however just a single person and therefore most likely not with any valuable items to trade. The shamans meanwhile receive most of our supply of pemmican and survival meals, in exchange we grab all the nutriamine they weirdly enough have, these are tribals after all, so I'm not entirely sure why they are carrying it. That lone visitor meanwhile receives all of the chocolate that they can afford, after all, every little bit of silver helps. In the evening then, we once again send out a hunting party, coincidentally in the very same location where we met the elephants earlier, we now have some rhinos, this time all four of them are coming at us simultaneously, so this does make things a bit more tricky. Still, as you can see, with stun and the right amount of firepower, no fight against animals is too hard, and with that our food supply for the next few days should be secured. After the fighting and back at the base, it is then time for Vulek to once again begin his death rest. This time he will receive the effect of three glucoside pumps, so he will move even faster than before once he wakes up. In the afternoon then, we queue up the construction of our first gene processors. Plural, because we do need more than one to work with all the gene packs we already have. This is also the reason why for some of the more advanced gene modding you will need quite the facility, not to mention power to feed all of those machines, another reason why we won't be able to explore this topic too much in this series. In the evening then, Ellie receives a recruitment inspiration, so should we, contrary to my plans at the moment, find one more person to join our ranks, then Ellie will be the woman for the job, under regular circumstances however her social skill of 6 is not quite there yet. Our two prisoners here meanwhile are not among the list of suitable candidates, even if Kevin finally succeeds in converting one of them, thus earning us another ideology development point, but at this point we are simply going to release them, after all they are now a proselytizer too, for whatever that is worth. At this point then, late in the episode it's time for some action, we are being raided, 149 Neanderthals have made their way into the jungle, and thankfully they are going to prepare a while before they will attack, which allows us to have Dimitri man the mortar. With so many of them clustered so closely together, we should be able to land a hit. And indeed, the first shot hits almost dead center and immediately produces 5 casualties, plus a good number of injuries, so we are off to a good start. Mortar shot number 2 then adds onto that, and we are not done yet. All of this is obviously just stalling for time until the real weapon arrives, and that weapon's name is Light. Equipped with a Doomsday rocket launcher, our last one by the way, he is now going to do what he has done several times before, cast invisibility on himself, skip in close and unleash hell. Mm -hmm. 
Now, as you can see, this does not cause the Neanderthals to flee immediately. However, it does decimate their numbers quite drastically. Thanks to his skip ability, meanwhile, Light does make it home safely, as the rest of our colony is already eagerly waiting for the enemy force to arrive. And for anyone too eager, we are using the tried and tested skip them where it hurts approach. I don't think we will have to eliminate that many more hostiles, and these are just troubles after all. So as tough as Neanderthals may be, against us they should still fall quickly. And indeed, there we go. After only a handful of kills, the rest of the raiding party decides to pack it up. And this time I have decided that we are not going to take any prisoners, mostly because the vast number of casualties is so far away that they would bleed out on the way over to our base. And with Vulek currently death resting, we also only have limited access to coagulate. So instead, let's do some more trading. A bulk goods trade is in orbit. This one, the recipient of our usual trade goods in exchange for cloth and neutroamine, both of which we do need regularly and do not produce ourselves. And while we have pots coming in, we also send some out. Our Knight Brandon will now be loaded into one with packaged survival meals, elephant tusks, camp fuel, and a lot of silver, as we are about to pay another visit to the Empire. Loading the parts then takes a few hours, but in the late afternoon we are good to go, and we are visiting this nearby settlement over here, we have been there once before, so we do know what they are selling, and that's exactly why we are going, because among the inventory is an excellent quality Altex skullcap, exactly what we need for our Psycaster light. We are also grabbing a bit more Neutroamin just to match the funds that our trade partners actually have. And by the way, while we are here, this also one of the last opportunities to grab this Persona Monosword might be a good weapon to give to Kraylith, our third dedicated melee fighter, or perhaps to the psychopath Nazim, who is equally good at ranged and melee combat. Either way, for now we'll leave it here, just because it is a bit too expensive to purchase without having an actual plan for it but let me know in the comments if you think that spending the 3,500 silver here would be worth it. Light, meanwhile, can equip the brand new Eltex skullcap, and on the following morning, Kevin can once again attempt to convert Nazim, and this time he succeeds. Our development points, therefore, up to 5 already, because, and I have not mentioned this before, we now actually get two development points for converting someone. One is given by default in any ideology, and thanks to the proselytizer meme, we now get a second one. And just like that, we then also finish the research of Arcogenetics, and so we are now ready to do some gene modding. Obviously, we were ready before unlocking this, but this allows us to include archive genes like Deathless, and that is something we definitely want to do. For our next project then, I think we will unlock Jump Packs. We acquired the tech print for this quite some time ago, it might have been in the first series actually. Still, considering our overproduction of chem fuel, this does make some sense, not to mention the extra mobility boost it gives us. Nonetheless, it is time, let us assemble our first genes. We will include all three gene packs we already have, and very fittingly I think we are now going to name the resulting genotype the Bloodless Sanguophage. Down the line we might want to change this to a patron name, but at the moment I'm not entirely sure yet how much of a role this is going to play for the rest of the series. Now, very importantly, assembling these genes will require an archite capsule. Thankfully, we do already have one lying around, but this is one of the ways that gene modding can become quite expensive, as archite capsules cannot be manufactured and always need to be bought. Now, it will take Kevin here six hours to assemble these genes, and since not a whole lot happens in the meantime, we can skip right ahead to the end of that process. The result then, a so-called xenogerm, which we can now implant into one of our colonists to give them the genes included, and at this point, the big question is, of course, who to give it to. This is something that I would like to hear from you guys in the comments down below. In the meantime, we can wake up Volek from his death rest and late in the evening also celebrate Elpis' birthday. Ellie's younger brother is now officially a child and can start learning things. So from this point onwards, we will now have two children running around Red Chapel. And I'm very interested to see the path that lies in front of Elpis. We are obviously also not going to enslave him, he will remain a tribesman, who then decides to equip himself with pants, shirts and a mega sloth wool veil. So perhaps Elp is a bit of the shy type. Once again, we'll see how he develops. A short moment later then, Kevin successfully converts our last prisoner, and as we release them and they make their way off the map, I think it is a good time to make the cut in today's episode. I think we have made a lot of good progress here today, so as we marvel at some more fan art from Isaac Young, this one continuing the drama between Took and Squigs, 
Once again, let me know who you think our first target for gene modifications should be. Who do you think should become a bloodless sanguophage? Let me know in the comments down below and we'll make a choice next episode. For today then, I hope you enjoyed this one and if you did, then I would be very happy if you could leave a thumbs up. And if you like what I'm doing and want to support me and my channel further, then you can of course go ahead and subscribe to stay up to date, grab some merch over on shop.peatcomplete.com or check out and maybe even pledge to the Pete Complete Patreon. Thank you all for watching and I'll see you next time. Cheers.